Welcome. I'm Rafael Gomez, host of Speaking Freely here on TLN, and also the current host of our mayoral candidate interviews. Here in the city of Toronto, we are going to have the election of elections. We are electing a new mayor this coming June, and TLN is interviewing some of the high-profile candidates that have stepped forward. Well, today we have none other than Giorgio Mammoliti, who's probably well known to viewers of the station and also to the community. Giorgio's had a long history in politics. We're going to get to that. But we're also going to start right off the top as to why he's re-entering politics to run for the mayor of the city. Giorgio, thank you for coming and joining us. Oh, no, my pleasure. And uh, I'm glad, you know, you're asking me this question. I hope you don't right. mind. I'm going to... I want you to start right off yeah, the bat. Why are you doing I this? I want to speak directly to the audience, sure. too, on this one. Please do. Uh, 30 years in politics, uh, provincially as an MPP and... Uh, the rest in North York and the city of Toronto went and amalgamated. Uh, I've done a lot of work. Uh, we've achieved a lot together. Uh, the community, uh, they have been my base. They've been my, uh, my support mechanism. Uh, in fact, I joke and say I was married to 100,000 people for <laughs> almost 30 years. Um, but yet I was yelling and screaming at times, trying to get our message out that uh, safety matters, family matters. Uh, our families uh, were uh, near the end of, uh, say, 2017 at risk, and I started saying that. Uh, and so I say that uh, right now. I say that the reason I'm running for mayor right now is because uh, my voice is needed. My voice at City Hall as your mayor is needed. I'm the one that will talk about family and family values. I'm the one that will speak to that as the primary uh, focus of my campaign everything around it speaks to family including safe streets and right now all the things that i was literally yelling and screaming about over the years is coming to fruition on our streets it's unsafe and the only person that will make those streets safer is me i've got a plan it'll be a comprehensive plan that deals with all of it it's not just enforcement it's about prevention and it's also about us being a bit sympathetic to the needs of people as well hmm. and um and having said that, we can get into all of the policies that I've already written that are already there uh, that I can just uh, pick up as though I, I never left. Yeah. And that's why I'm running for mayor. Safe streets, make sure our families and our children are safe and respected. We've lost the respect for our families. and mm -hmm. We've let a few people disrespect us. It's time that, that a mayor gets into place mm -hmm. that will bring that level of respect back to our families. Well, that's interesting. That's a new message. We don't hear that often uh, anymore. I think that was a, a message that was heard in the past. Maybe I'll, before we get into those specific policy measures, I just want to pick up on something you just mentioned, which was that uh, you know you you've come from a long history in politics. I, I think for the viewers that a new generation has come since you yeah. started, as you said, 30 years ago. Tell us a little bit more of that journey, because I want to pick up on this theme, uh, Giorgio. That is, you know, kind of interesting. We're in this candidate field that's very large now. I think it will finally bring some diversity to our mayoral uh, mm -hmm. position, yeah. right? You coming as a, a, an immigrant voice, an Italian-Canadian community, is a huge impact in, in, in Canada and our city. But it's kind of underrepresented, like many immigrant groups in politics. Why do you think that is? Just speak to that point that you are one of the few oh, that gosh, has I... sort of come, come forward and been a politician. But why are immigrants, why are people from our ethnic communities not so involved in politics? You know, when I, when I, when I first came uh, to uh, the Jane and Finch Quarter, which I, which I grew up in, hmm. Jane and Shepherd, right. um, we, were, we were amongst the, the very few Italian families that, that were settled in, in, in the suburbs uh, at that point. And the minute we, we moved into my, our neighborhood, we were told uh, very, very cruelly that, that we smelled, that... <laughs> that that um, we weren't allowed to play with uh, our friends or, or visit them in their homes. I grew up with, with a sense of, of you know, I want to kind of show you that, that I can make it in your world, so to speak. And knowing, uh, after representing almost 2,000 workers in Ontario housing, um, uh, as, as my it's, career built speaks up. Speaks to your union background, right? Yeah. And it goes to the union background. Uh, I knew that we needed a voice for not just the Italian community, but all the immigrants that are settling because mm -hmm. we were all kind of treated the same. Mm -hmm. and, and it was almost like we weren't wanted, right? right? And, mm -hmm. and so uh, a guy like me, who is a scrapper, I'll <laughs> admit it, right? mm -hmm. I, I grew up in the Jane and Finch corridor. And, mm -hmm. and for me, I love that corridor to this day. Uh, 
and someone needs to defend the 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 rights of people that are are coming into this country and and wanting to call it theirs and mm -hmm. wanting to raise their families and mm -hmm. I, and I felt that I needed to do that at a young age and mm -hmm. I went through the legislature doing it in mm -hmm. fact when the, the first day mm -hmm. that I that I reported out into the legislature after the election in 1990 mm -hmm. someone came to me I hope you don't mind me doing no. this yeah. and said oh Nice, nice suit. Where'd you get it? Right. I think we all know what that means, right? Oh, yeah. And so uh, for me, uh, at that point, I said, well, uh, I'll tell you where I got it. Mm -hmm. I got it with my, 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 my work ethic, my, my family values, my, my, my parents telling me that I needed to wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning to go to work. Mm -hmm. That's where I was able to afford my first suit which I wore in the legislature, by the way. Right. And so to this day, I still feel I'm, I'm, I'm speaking for uh, those that have chosen Canada as their, as their home. Well, that's, that's a nice description, especially for a part of our audience, part of our, our, our city and our potential voters that aren't familiar with that early history, right, that, where you come from. The flip side of that, Georgia, and you said you're a scrapper, we know that, uh, is that a long history brings potentially controversies. So right. you've, you've had your share. And I would say part of the uh, allure of Giorgio is that you've always you know, fought back. Uh, whatever has adversity you felt, you've kind of maintained uh, that consistency in your, in your message. But you've also not been doctrinaire. When you were in parliament, let's, let's tell the audience, you were an NDP MP yeah. and MPP. Uh, and then when you were in council, you seemed to be aligned with so-called the forces of more conservative or, or uh, the politics of, of, of that time. You, you kind of seemed... Well, what's happened to his NDP background? He sort of jettisoned it. How do you square those those uh, histories? Look, if you, you know, will? you know, uh, I, I ran um, uh, back in 1990, hoping that I would be uh, elected into office. My gut was telling me that I should do that for the reasons we just spoke about. Right. Uh, I did that. I, sp I spent five years in the legislature, and thank God I did. A lot of experience. I belonged to a party that came after me at uh, 27 years old. And at 27 years old, you're saying, well, they want me. Of course, I'm going mm -hmm. to come and I'm going to do my, be my best. But let me just tell you this. It didn't take me long to realize I wasn't a New Democrat. Remember I spoke about uh, work, work ethic and yeah. values and all of that? Mm -hmm. That's all you hear in the, you know, in the hallways of, of in the legislature were excuses uh, to give people the reason not to work, not to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning, and giving them uh, whatever they wanted. So I, I kind of figured at that point, this party isn't for me. And uh, I went into municipal politics after that, after 1995, uh, in North York with Mel Lassman, and brought out the true uh, Mammoliti. The flavor that people uh, got was a guy who didn't want to deal with any parties. Hmm. I wanted the flexibility to be able to move into municipal politics to represent everybody, no matter what colors uh, they belong to politically, or no matter what color of their skin. And, and for me, uh, that was important. So people criticize, they say, well, you, you know, you've done this and you've done that. Well, how do, you, how do you expect to represent your community or the city of Toronto if you can't feel it in your gut, if you can't feel the movement? Mm. People in their living rooms tend to go right with some equations. Mm. They want policing. Mm -hmm. They want hard-ass policing at times, right? Uh, sometimes they, they go left. They want you to take care of them to a large degree. Sometimes they just can't make up their mind and, and they want somebody to do it for them in the middle. So that's who I am. I can go left. I can go right. I can come down the middle. I can write the policies that everybody wants me to. In fact, I did. In the legislature, I wrote the policy on how to on how to uh, uh, treat drug addiction in, in, mm. in, in 1991. Mm. That, was a, that was the pivotal moment where we decided that healthcare was going to mm. be the, the channel to, to treat drug addiction. Before that, it was the responsibility of the Minister of Tourism for crying out loud mm. until I got my 28-year hands on that and said, this is what I want to do. Mm. I wrote the affordable housing policy mm -hmm. at the City of Toronto, the first one. Uh, in North America, the te first 10-year plan in North America. That, to me, is an obligation to the people that, that need government the most. It doesn't mean we give it away. It means that we have to recognize as, as officials that we have to take care of the most vulnerable people in society. Seniors, you know, I've been pushing and will continue to push for, for seniors to have home care in their, in their homes instead of 
you know, shuffling them off into institutions that today are not yeah. working. Yeah. So I've been yelling about all of these things, and some people just didn't want to listen. And 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 then you know that you're labeled. You're 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 told that you're you know you're a troublemaker. You know, and, mm -hmm. and that's where that came from, right? Mm -hmm. But now, right now, and I'm going to look at the audience. I was right. All of the things that that I spoke about and people were criticizing me about are now saying they need a leader to take care of. Well, I've got those solutions. I've got the solutions to take care of you on the streets, the subways. I've, I, I've got a comprehensive plan coming out to make sure your children can go play in the parks again without having to worry about needles. I've got a whole plan that says the police department should be coming to your door when your fishing rod is missing. Instead of them telling you, we can't take care of this call because we don't have the priorities. They should be coming to your door when your car is stolen. They should be coming to your door. You're the taxpayers. So for me, it's a comprehensive approach to shuffle around the money, prioritize with a, with a, with mm -hmm. a good audit that speaks to going after the taxpayers' needs and going after safety in this city. Our children come first and our families come first. Well, Joey, that's a powerful message. Um, and, and you stand out as an a, a interesting candidate because what I've been doing with this, this field, the people we've been interviewing, as I said, I kind of break down between those that have been political insiders and outsiders. And some of the outsiders, oddly enough, say the things you're saying. Uh, the paradox, of course, in your case, Georgia, is because you, you, you've been in politics for a long time, but the story is that you don't play well with others, that you're not the person who's going to bring people together mm -hmm. to do the things you want. You might split them apart. How do you answer that uh, conjecture? The people, I, the people I bring together, uh, and it's a proven record, the people that I bring together are the voters, are the homeowners, are the people that rent are the people that are having difficulties in their home eating right now. The, the, the seniors who are eating cat food for crying out loud because they can't afford, they can't afford groceries. Those are the people I bring together um, incredibly. And, and if I didn't, I wouldn't have been elected for 30 years. Mm -hmm. That the tough approach has to say, uh, they matter first mm -hmm. before the people that you work with well, in city council. Right. So how do you bring them together? Exactly. They're all selfish. Right? Let's face it, you know, everybody is selfish and they want a position. And the minute you offer them a position uh, of authority in a, and, and there's nothing wrong with that, right? Mm -hmm. you, you offer them a position of authority, you'll see how quick they come together. They did it with Mel Lastman, they did it with Miller. Uh, the, gosh, I did it with Miller, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. uh, I sat with him and I said, I can't agree with you politically on most things, but uh, let's talk about our common denominator. Where is it? And it was affordable housing. So he appointed me to the chair of affordable housing. I created the first committee. I wrote the policy. He was proud of that and he showcased it, right? Mm. That's how I'm going to bring everybody together at, at City Hall. Now, I'm not going to fight with everybody. That, that is ridiculous. We have got to run a city and right now we've got priorities. And let me say this to you. Mm -hmm. If any of the councillors uh, feel like they can't contribute, uh, to, to moving forward with an agenda to, to clean up the subways, uh, clean up the, the, the mm -hmm, streets, mm -hmm. our parks. And if that's not a priority for them right now, then they may not get the position. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's okay. So we've done a few of these interviews. That's been a common theme. I think there's, there's been a sense that no one is denying a bit of the, the slippage that's happened in our city. But I think there's an elephant in the room, and I think you've been trying to address it too, is the pandemic and our policies huh. to respond to the pandemic. We've left a legacy, and we're kind of not recognizing it, or we're not addressing it. Think of the small businesses Good that were question. closed multiple times. Think of essentially the TTC was abandoned, Good question. and the homeless were moved there yeah. as a strategy to not have them uh, be getting sick inside of shelters. And then we wanted to flip a switch, reopen society, but not address these issues. Yeah. How are you kind of dealing with that uh, that kind of question? Well, we've moved into an era where the bureaucrats are telling the politicians what to do for some reason. Mm -hmm. And I think the pande pandemic was certainly a prime example of that. Mm -hmm. Politicians are afraid. They're afraid to speak their mind now. Um, 
You feel that, uh, even I've, yourself. Uh, uh, no, never. <laughs> no, no, no. I will never be afraid to tell the truth mm -hmm. and to be honest with the public on anything. In this particular case, I have to tell you, I came out yesterday mm -hmm. and said I would fire Dr. Davila. Mm -hmm. There's a whole slew of reasons why I want to fire her. Mm -hmm. One, I think her policies have made our streets unsafe. This is our public health officer it in is. Toronto, for it those who are watching, watching this across the it country. It is, and yeah. she was the one yeah. uh, leading the charge and, and telling, telling the politicians yeah. what to do uh, over COVID. Now, over COVID, we can we can have that big discussion if we want. But well, at the end of the day... Thinking forward, like, how do you recover from some of those policies? By right? firing yeah. some of the people that have caused the problems. Mm -hmm. And you have, and they, and, and you've got to take, uh, you've got to take accountability for the mistakes. You know, you're making three, three fifty, three hundred fifty thousand dollars a year, some of them, and they don't take, ex uh, you know, responsibility for some of the problems. That's more They're than the, the ones, premier, is it? No, I'm just suggesting. Yeah, yeah, you know, these yeah. are huge numbers, yeah, right? Absolutely. No, some of them do. If you take into the account uh, their cars and their expenses and all of that, it's it's absolutely. 300 G's a year. Mm -hmm. So you got to take, uh, you got to own up to uh, mistakes that you've made as a leader. And some of these department heads, I have to be honest with you, have convinced politicians to move in particular directions, right? Mm -hmm. Dr. Davila mm -hmm. is one of them, and it's mm -hmm. my opinion that she's done a horrible job. And so I'm, that she's the first one I'm going to fire. Based on what? The school closures? The, the take, a, take a look at everything. Did, um, do you feel comfortable walking through an area that has a safe injection site or a so-called safe injection site? It was her policies that brought forward, try to convince uh, councillors and politicians that it's actually safer to have these things. Mm -hmm. Go on any one of them. Did you know that all of them are full of, of enca encampments, camp mm -hmm. encampments now and, and people sleeping on the streets and taking their drugs on the streets? Mm -hmm. She now wants to decriminalize all the other drugs, right. making it very difficult for our 12-year-olds. Mm -hmm. She's bringing it, she's touching your child right now. Mm -hmm. She is suggesting that your child can take drugs at 12 years old. How do you feel as a parent? Mm. How does anyone feel that way? So, so she has brought this forward. Did you know that the federal government passed a law that said that anybody, uh, that any municipality that takes on uh, uh, these safe injection right. sites, the police are told not to make any arrests, mm. not of those that are breaking any laws and not of the dealers that are selling, right? Mm -hmm. So why do I need to fire her? because her influence of politicians brought unsafe streets to the city of Toronto, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. The other reason is because our seniors, asking any one of them during COVID, felt like, mm. like someone was trying to kill them, right? And, and without an explanation. Well, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's absolutely, that's undebatable. The majority yeah. of our, our, our deaths happen in our nursing homes. Uh, it happened in the big cities. Um, Ontario and Quebec, basically the, the bulk of that happened there. So, and, but to push back, there was sort of research done uh, in terms of all the nursing homes, the ones that were municipally run actually had better outcomes than the sort of wide array of, of semi-private and non-profits. And you know, so the city could take ownership over that, sort of build it up as a, a case study of, of success. I mean, how do you throw that back at you? Well, there are, there are better checks and balances uh, with, uh, with city-run mm -hmm. uh, facilities. I'm a huge advocate of, uh, you know, the police and the fire department and paramedics in our, in our, in our seniors' mm -hmm. homes. Uh, the question becomes, how, how can we afford mm -hmm. to bring them into uh, the next level? Sure. It's very expensive. Mm -hmm. We don't have the money. And I don't know if you know this, but we don't need to be in that business. Yeah, right? no, fair enough. Uh, we only have an obligation of, of having two legally in the city of Toronto, but we've chosen to have, I think there's 14 or 15 mm -hmm. now. Yeah. Do we really want to do this or should we tell the province that they have a responsibility so that we can take the money that's yeah, saved that's in these areas and put them into uh, safety and other in other categories right yeah and that's that's the kind of leadership i'm going to bring i'm going to say look enough's enough right mm -hmm. like we, we got to take care of our families so mm -hmm. uh, they come first and i'm sorry mr premier i'm sorry uh, prime minister uh, in toronto we've got to put our foot down and say um, it's time either you help or we're going to have to make some really difficult decisions. So uh, picking up on some of that, the, the, the question around uh, who does what in our, pro in our city versus our province comes down to decisions that were made uh, 30 years ago, you know, yeah. under the then progressive conservative government yeah. that um, created the what was then called the mega city. Yeah. It kind of took the voice of people who right. you know in North York that, that I grew up in Scarborough or, or in uh, the city of Toronto even. 
and it kind of dispersed it and it made it less accountable in my opinion. I think amalgamation in the city of Toronto was, was a real failure. People say we can't revisit that. But you have this interesting uh, background. You grew up, as you said, in, in the sort of northwest part of the city. Jane and Finch. Jane and Finch. But you worked downtown, Queen's Park, City Hall for the bulk of years. You can kind of understand the two, the two solitudes, if you will. Is there a mechanism that you can see that could, fine, we might not be able to you know, uh, bring back the former city of Toronto and its metro structure, which was the model for the rest of the world. Is there a way to bring more democratic accountability to these areas of the city that felt neglected, especially during the pandemic? No, you're, and you're right, you bring back the, the nursing homes. One of the worst policies ever was not allowing family members, not even one right. family member to go in and take right. care. They weren't listening. Right. They couldn't hear the voices of people. Right. These nursing homes, a lot of them scattered around. How do you get that accountability, that local knowledge that can really work? Well, let me just say that, uh, you know, we got our first taste of communism during uh, during the pandemic. Governments loved uh, being at the helm because they didn't have to uh, account to anyone. They made the stupid decisions, quite frankly. Uh, one of them is, is loading up this whole city with bike lanes. We don't even know how much it's going to cost us. Billions of dollars still that's unaccounted for, right? So, so, it, so it, how all do you happened, get those it all happened during COVID. Yeah. So how do you get it back? You restructure. I think now is an era where people are... I suggested, by the way, mm -hmm. that, that we take our community councils and mm -hmm. give them more autonomy. Make right. sure local neighborhoods are more represented. These what, are the councils that are based in the old city halls. That's right. And, and, <clears throat> and, and councillors that are elected sure. would, would be the voice for the people there. R right now, the megacity took all of their leverage away from them, all of their voice away from them, from, from communities. And that's why you see suburbs like North York, Scarborough, mm -hmm. York, mm -hmm. all underserviced because mm -hmm. all the money's being spent south of Davenport, right? <laughs> yeah. And so for me, I, I want to bring a, a very unique way of making sure that every single family is consulted with every key decision that we're making. Mm -hmm. And why is it that we have to talk about a tree in council and spend 16 hours on a tree uh, in a, debating a tree and whether or not we should keep it or not? Those are things that communities should, yeah. and that's just an example, by the yeah. way. There's so Absolutely, many others, yeah. right? So bringing back the voice mm -hmm. for families, and it doesn't end in, in community um, mm -hmm. the council halls. Uh, I believe that city hall should actually move. And every month we should have our, mm. our, our city hall meetings mm. in the different communities. Because there's a lot of people that work for a living, believe sure. it or not. <laughs> and they cannot come to the meetings. And the only people that seem to be coming to those meetings and us listening to are the ones that don't seem to have a job, perhaps, and, and want us to listen to their particular problems. I want to listen to the problems of the taxpayer, the people that actually wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning as well. I want to listen to them too and, and find out whether or not our policies are reflective mm -hmm. of those hardworking people. Single mothers who have a hard time, um, uh, let, you know, have a hard time seeing their children at times because they've got three jobs. Mm -hmm. How do you expect that person to come to City Hall at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and spell out what her differences might be? Sure. No, this is the guy. Mm -hmm. This is the guy. This is the guy that isn't going to isn't going to worry about political correctness. I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to structure it properly. I'm going to do it legally, and I'm going to make sure that everybody in this city is represented properly. Mm. Nobody else. Yeah. I can tell you that right now. How many how many candidates are there? Well, I just this morning the I think 42nd or 43rd oh. announced. Well, just take <laughs> note of this one candidate because he's the one that's already done it, already written policy. It's collect most of the policies I've written are collecting dust at, at City Hall. I want to bring that out and I can do that in a hurry. Why is it that we don't use private private landlords to house people mm -hmm. that need it the most right now? Uh, you know, you've got other candidates that I'm sure you're talking to that claim that they know everything about affordable housing. I wrote the policy and in that it is included utilizing the landlords out there and mm. vacancies in Toronto mm. and giving them, yes, giving landlords a bit of a subsidy. Sure. And if we did that, we can house people tomorrow, right? Instead, we're looking at how to build affordable housing in a garage, uh, in, a, in an alleyway downtown. That's some, that's some people are saying they're champions because they did that. We've already got a policy that talks about the private sector, that talks about building uh, in, in the middle of two high-rise buildings that have a large parcel on. Build another one, right? Mm -hmm. Build another one and make it happen. Uh, we've already got the policies in place. I wrote them. 
and I can do it in a hurry. I'm just quickly going into the affordable housing for a second. Uh, no, it's a, it's a great way to sort of tie things up because we started talking about the immigrant experience, you know, in your own family. And Toronto is going to be the recipient of hundreds of thousands of immigrants, given the federal policies on immigration. And if we're not ready, as you say, we can recreate the problems of the past and not have these sort of uh, ready-made policies that could make Toronto the city that everyone wants to come to, but also stay. Because that's the other feeling, that people are are thinking about leaving, which would be a terrible, you know, consequence is, for Toronto. isn't it time for us to encourage people that want to come to Toronto to work as well? Absolutely, yeah. And and not just give them a huge welfare check when they get here and, and keep them on. We got six generations of welfare, by the way. Wait till you hear what my plan might be to break the cycle of welfare in this uh in this city. Mm. It's coming out. And, All right. and and I know I can do it. And and we should be encouraging people to go to work. We should be training them. We should we should accept them with open arms and say, we will pay you to a degree, but you're not going to be there for another 30 years collecting collecting welfare on everyone else's dime. You've got to teach them how to how to how to how to work in a country that they've never been in. Teach them, be friendly with them, make sure that the unions get involved, make sure that they're all kind of happy and, and get them working, right? Well, Giorgio, this could be the opportunity. As the mayor of the city, you could bring to light your past as a trade union yeah, exactly person, your doing. experience in Jane and Finch, um, and uh, those years of experience on our own city council. So, you can do it in Italian if you like. <laughs> That's all right. Hablo espanol, uh, un poquito de espanol. Uh, well, that's good. I could do it in three different languages. Well, Give me the opportunity. Trust me. Trust me, and you'll see this, this city go back to the way, the way it's supposed to be. Well, on that note, I want to thank you again, Giorgio, for joining us here on our mayoral debate series, and uh, wish you the best of luck on the campaign. Thank you very much. And to TLN, mm -hmm. I want a, a special thank you. Mm -hmm. I've represented TLN in my former community That's right. uh, on Steeles Avenue for almost 30 years. You That's guys right. are wonderful. Just yeah. wonderful. Well, yeah. appreciate that. Yes, they were a long-time uh, residents in, in, your, in your riding. Thank you. Thank you.